Vladimir Putin. What normally comes to mind when I mention his name? Is it simply his face and image, whether that be surprised, menacing, or just his overall figure? What about the 2016 election collusion? That's probably what you first thought of. Everyone remembers that going down. But what about the poisoning of Alexei Navalny? Sound familiar? That was actually more recent, happening only last year. Alexei Navalny is a Russian lawyer who turned into an opposition leader and eventually the Russian government's biggest threat since the Soviet era. Navalny is responsible for the expression, a party of crooks and thieves, which soon became the term for Putin's ruling political party, United Russia. In 2016, Navalny announced that he planned on running for Russian president under the party Russia of the Future. The campaign process was rough for Russia of the Future, especially Navalny, who was elected to represent them. Other than his rallies, he spent his 2017 in and out of prison, serving a total of two months in increments between five to 20 days. The 2018 elections happened, and after much anticipation, Navalny wasn't eligible? The election commission did not allow him to run. The reasoning was that Navalny had a criminal record from the Kirovles case, an event that convicted Navalny guilty of embezzlement. The case is widely regarded as an attempt to destroy Navalny's reputation, with Russian media constantly present to slander him during trial. The European Court of Human Rights determined that Navalny was held to an unfair trial against the Russian courts, and his five-year sentence was cut down to only three. Once he was freed, the court tried him for a second time, and just like the first, Navalny was given two years, the rest of his first sentence, unfairly. The European Court once again ruled an unfair trial. However, Navalny ended up serving the rest of his sentence and is now free. The election committee still refused to admit him to the next election and said that he is not allowed to run for the next 15 years. Boris Ebziv told Russian news network RBC, a citizen who, on the day of his nomination, has an outstanding or expunged conviction for grave crimes has no right to be elected. Ironic. The next year, Navalny would be attacked and sprayed by green dye into his face. Doctors believe that there was more than just dye in the spray. Navalny said that he had lost 80% of his eyesight in his right eye, however he had recovered a few months after the attack. Navalny believed that the Kremlin organized it. In 2019, Navalny was arrested another time for holding a public event without consent of the government, setting the example that anyone rallying against the Kremlin would be sent to jail. Actually, Navalny technically was doing it illegally, whether the morals were there or not. Surprise, they were not. A few months before Navalny's arrest, President Putin signed a law that made it illegal for people to criticize the government, including him. Those who show blatant disrespect can be fined up to 100,000 rubles, or roughly $1,500, for something as simple as disrespecting the Russian flag or government. Repeating offenders will be given jail time, serving up to 15 days. Navalny was sentenced to 10 days after his unauthorized rally, signifying the extreme lengths Russia will go to censor opposition. In the summer of 2020, Navalny began posting videos on his YouTube channel criticizing the government in Belarus and showing support for the pro-democracy protests happening there. The Russian government decided it was time to stop denying their involvement with attacks on the opposition. On a flight to Siberia, Navalny collapsed after being attacked by Novichok, a nerve agent. Of course, this wasn't the first time Navalny has dealt with poisonings and attacks. But what separates this one is hidden in the history of the poison. The only ones to have access to this chemical weapon are the Russian government, because the only ones who made the chemical were the Soviets, storing it in private facilities. Meaning the only way for Navalny to suffer from a Novichok attack would be from someone with access to the chemicals. Interesting, right? Navalny was immediately taken to a hospital in Germany, where he would be placed into a medically induced coma. The investigations began not long after Navalny was treated. Investigators found that the Novichok agent was stronger and more dangerous than before, and acted more slowly. It was planned that Navalny would die on board the plane, but the quick emergency landing and medical practice during the flight barely kept him alive. The German agents that were looking into the poisoning concluded that only Russian special services could have such a deadly and complex poison. Last December, during the annual press conference, Putin never denied involvement with the poisoning. Instead, when asked about it, his response was, but that absolutely does not mean he needs to be poisoned. Who needs him? If somebody had wanted to poison him, they would have finished him off. 
what does that even mean? Putin completely dodged answering the question of involvement. But sometimes, saying nothing relevant is almost as useful as confessing. Or maybe actions are more useful than anything. The people of Ukraine have been actively protesting for years. The revolution of dignity alarmed the Russian government due to other protests in Moscow from, yet again, another rigged election. The Moscow protest was quickly dealt with. However, the Kremlin feared that a real revolution in Ukraine would inspire the Russian people to do the same. Ukraine is tied to Russia in many ways, culturally, economically, and family ties. Nearly half of all Ukrainians have relatives in Russia. Giving the unhappy Russian population a successful model to protest themselves would free both the Russian and Ukrainian people and have closer connections with the European Union. The Kremlin feared the protest, so they launched a political campaign to turn it into their favor. Putin's first plan of action was to force all Russian media to depict Ukraine as poorly as possible. Newspapers and broadcasters would flood the Russian networks to the point where Ukraine protests seem more important than anything going on in their own country, a diversion for the people to focus on. The goal of the media was to show the people that a path of revolution and protest will lead to a dangerous country compared to the normalcy that Russia has. Then began the engagement with Crimea. Crimeans have been historically closer with Russia and get their news from Russia more often than Ukraine. The Ukrainian protests, of course, had their extremists, which the Russians placed on full display. The Crimeans were affected most by showings of politically radical protests. They were shown neo-Nazis taking over their country. The Crimeans felt threatened by everything happening and would turn on Ukraine and view Putin and Russia as their saviors. With the false support of the Crimean and Russian people, Putin illegally annexed Crimea and began pushing troops in. Ukraine had prepared defenses, however their allies in the West wanted to make sure that the Russians fired first. The peninsula saw armed men taking over checkpoints and important facilities in Crimea. Putin denied that these were Russian forces and said that he had no involvement, only to later admit that they were sent by him and even awarded the commanders. By the time the Russian soldiers became very noticeable, they had already secured much of Crimea. The Crimean Supreme Council followed by having a vote. The options were to rejoin Russia or to become an independent nation, which, you can probably infer, would end up in Russian hands anyways. Those were the only two options. The ballot did not have any option for voters to say that they wanted to be a part of Ukraine. Seems a little unfair, doesn't it? Don't worry. There were also no credible international observers, so the vote was basically not even up for consideration. Oh, but this is the Kremlin we're talking about, so you bet they acted like this was real. When looking at the numbers, the voter turnout the officials showed was 83%, with over 95% voting to be annexed by Russia. Putin's approval rating skyrocketed to nearly 90%, giving United Russia enough to stay popular for another five years. But the thing that Putin forgot to consider was that 40% of Crimea were ethnic Ukrainians who will be against Russia no matter how much bias news is thrown at them. A leaked report showed that only 30% of the people voted, and the voting results were only about 50-50. Regardless, the vote went through and Russia signed the Treaty of Ascension of the Republic of Crimea, and now both countries claim it. Most of the world recognizes Crimea as a part of Ukraine because, if you recall, no international officials were present during the voting, so the fake results weren't even checked by anyone. On the Russian side, they claim the peninsula because, well, they have troops there and that vote. The Crimean problem still exists to this day. Putin's ratings are continuing to fall, as the problem still has not been solved, and the opposition is beginning to rise as one leader, Alexei Navalny, gains support for his actions. Russians weren't only holding fraudulent elections in Ukraine. Russia's State Duma elections, or the lower house of parliament, had just finished counting the votes for this year's election. United Russia, as you can expect, won over two-thirds of the 450 seats, with just around 50% of the vote. Keep in mind Russia is a multi-party system, meaning they go against many different parties each election rather than only one, like the United States. Meaning that United Russia won by a huge majority. Alexei Navalny and his supporters are encouraging protests saying that the vote is not legitimate, and with a lot of evidence to support that. Many cities were introduced to electronic voting. In Moscow, the new voting type was shown to the people last minute, meaning it was not a well-known option to pick there. You probably had to know in advance if you wanted to vote electronically. For the first time since 1993, 
election observers from the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe were not present because of limitations set by the Russian authorities. A video in a BBC article shows various acts of election fraud. Different examples include people using balloons or their bodies to block security cameras, vote counters acting suspiciously with ballot boxes, and even a video of people wearing lab coats and gloves going through a ballot box outside of a polling station and stuffing it with votes. If you are interested in seeing the footage yourself, head to bbc.com and search Russia election footage in the search bar. An independent vote monitoring group called Golos said they received over 5,000 reports of election fraud. Golo said people claimed that they were being forced to vote by their employer and that people in eastern Ukraine with Russian citizenship, many of which are Ukrainian separatists, crossed the border to vote. The government also blocked the voting app from Apple and Google Play stores. A smart voting app created by none other than Navalny was removed the day elections began. The app's main purpose was to get other oppositionists to rally behind a candidate who was against the Kremlin, whether they agreed with them or not. All voters had to do was put in their address and a list of names who they should vote for would come up. The candidate could be a liberal, Stalinist, or nationalist. Navalny and his team wanted to get as many non-Kremlin officials in there, not caring who it was. It is unclear if the app helped sway the elections, although United Russia did see a 4% drop in percentage this year. However, the State Duma only had a turnout of 52%, so the smart voting app experiment cannot be proven. Different tactics can be found in St. Petersburg, where current anti-Kremlin leader Boris Vizhnevsky found candidates on the ballot box that looked exactly like him. Vizhnevsky told sources that the ballot options included three men who looked similar to him and had legally changed their names to match him so voters would be confused on who to pick. Vizhnevsky has been in politics for years and said that Russian elections are the dirtiest of any. To see what the ballot looks like yourself, Search up Boris V-I-S-H-N-E-V-S-K-Y election ballot. Here's a hint. The real candidate is the only one who bothered to wear a tie. Beyond election corruption, Putin has worked his way around the economy as well. In 2005, Putin ordered a program to improve Russian healthcare facilities, which were in poor condition since the collapse of the USSR. Five years later, it was discovered that suppliers were selling medical equipment at double or triple the market price. The authorities charged 104 people for overpricing the equipment. However, Reuters, an international investigative group, found two associates of Putin made millions and that they were never convicted. The associates sold medical scanners for $195 million, well over the normal rate. $84 million of the profit went to Swiss bank accounts, and $48 million of that money made its way to a luxury company, working on a project called Putin's Palace. Of course, all transactions were done in Russian rubles, however, I'm using dollars for clarity. So the only sellers to not get caught were ones funneling money into a mansion on the Black Sea made for the president? Pretty much. The taxpayer money was spent on the very expensive scanners, which would end up going towards the palace. Putin had literally spent Russian citizens' money on a house. For himself. The mansion is absolutely massive, and you can see it for yourself with a quick search. Funny enough, the palace is experiencing bad mold problems all over the place. This is not the only time Putin has laundered or embezzled money. In fact, he even has people do it for him. Oleg Deripaska, the founder of Russian industrial company Basic Element, was dealing with allegations from the US Treasury last year that he had been laundering millions of dollars for Putin. The Office of Foreign Assets also claimed Deripaska was holding assets for the president, which would not be too unordinary as Putin and Deripaska have deep financial ties, according to Forbes magazine. U.S. Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin said that the Russian government has bad intentions with the laundered money, and accused them of wanting to instigate violence in Eastern Europe. Mnuchin said that Russian elites and oligarchs are looking to profit heavily from the system and get away with it all. He specifically targeted Deripaska in his accusation, saying that he was threatening the lives of business rivals, illegally wiretapping a government official, and taking part in extortion and racketeering. Deripaska claimed that the Treasury is specifically targeting him for popularity, and his lawyer said that the U.S. is coming after his wealth, reputation, and economic livelihood. The last thing I'd like to discuss is probably what you've been waiting for. How Russia influenced the 2016 elections. The technique the Russians have mastered is presenting the people with what Russia wants them to see. Over 50,000 Russian bot accounts on Twitter were created to share false information and build more morale for Trump supporters. 
it was estimated that these bots accounted for one-fifth of every tweet related to the election, and around 80% of the bots had hashtags, such as hashtag Donald Trump, hashtag Trump 2016, hashtag never Hillary, and hashtag Trump Pence 16. A reason that Russia would want to do this is because of Putin's hatred for Hillary Clinton, who the Kremlin accused of supporting protests in Moscow in 2011. It was found out only two years ago, Trump campaign chairman Paul Manafort was a Russian intelligence officer? Manafort was meeting with Russian attorney Natalia Vizelnitskaya, who was organizing an intelligence operation. While Putin did not actually change the counts on the votes, or anything crazy that you might have heard, there is still proof of collusion, which can simply be defined as the United States and Russia wrongly working together to help Trump win the election. The 2020 election saw Russian attempts to re-elect Trump, however many of the tricks were the same as last time, so they were more easily spotted. Russian botnets and accounts were quickly deleted, and people could spot the fake accounts easier. It is important to note that Russian hackers tried to gain access to Joe Biden's secret files, but failed. This was how Hillary Clinton's emails were leaked during the 2016 election. The bots now share dozens of controversial stories, no matter the credibility. The goal is to divide the American people for Putin's gain. Through all the suppression, money scandals, and foreign interference, it doesn't seem as if Putin is going anywhere anytime soon. Because all of these tricks are just some of the many, many ways Vladimir Putin has managed to keep the crown. I'm Colton Gottlob for WCHS, a voice for Communications High School.